Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd, I'd like to thank you for coming to this very important, very not press conference. Um, the reason why I've called everybody here today is because I know there's been a lot of concerns with the, the leadership of the United Conservative Party. And I hear those concerns. I take that. It's very good feedback. I take that feedback. And I just want to be very clear. I'm open to the leadership review. And no matter what the results of the leadership review are, I will be continuing to pursue leadership. Uh, because I, if there's one thing that I'm sure of, it's uh, if there's anybody who should be running the province of Alberta, it's, uh, it's not Jason Kenney. So I'll take your questions now. Uh, Mr. Not Jason Kenney, uh, what qualifies you to be the, the leader of the UCP? Well, I, appreciate, I appreciate the question, although I, I, I fully reject the premise of it. Um, I, want to be, I want to be clear. There is, uh, there's probably a lot of names that could be kicked around, but there is nobody who's qualified um, who could do it. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the person who is leading Alberta into the future, I believe, has to be not Jason Kenney. All right, and what qualifies you to be the leader of the UCP? I think fundamentally what the, the biggest qualification that, that anybody needs to have to be the, the premier of the province at this point in, in history is that they're not Jason Kenney. Uh, so I think that answers your question. Um, try to come up with a better one, okay, sweetie? All right. So given the fact that we're in the, the fourth wave of COVID, which was widely predicted, uh, and you had still opened us up for the best summer ever, which is debatable at best, and now we're in the middle of the fourth wave and we are exhausting our healthcare workers, our resources, and it's not getting better. Any thoughts? You know, COVID has been a challenge around the world and uh, there's a lot of different leaders that have had to, to face it and provide evidence-based solutions. And I'm proud of the fact that we opened for, for summer. I think there's no question that if there's, there's any leader who responded effectively to, to COVID-19, it's, uh, it's not Jason Kenney. When other provinces were talking about doing COVID vaccine passports, you were strongly against doing this. Uh, so you changed your mind, we have one now, but we can edit it to make it say whatever we want, which is really fun and really thoughtful of you, but just, uh, I wanna know why. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a better question there, sweetie, but I, I still think you need to do some work. The, look, the bottom line is this, when it comes to who's responsible for the, the vaccine passports, it's, uh, it's not Jason Kenney. And that's, that's a really important thing to, to highlight. Uh, we had a, a health minister at the time, uh, but he's he's been moved out of the the picture. Oh, I can I can answer that. I'm I'm still relevant. I swear. Damn it, Shahandi! I I told you I put you in a portfolio where no one would notice you for a reason. Don't you have like a driveway to go occupy or something? Get out of here. As I was saying, it's it's not my fault. All right. Well, moving on from that, uh, are you prepared to tell us where you actually were uh, back in August? You have a nice little tan, a nice glow. Yeah, f you. Ah, f you too. Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown, and we are back in sunny Edmonton after way too long. Obviously, there's been a lot of stuff that's been going on, and I am thrilled that we're able to dedicate all of our energy back to The Breakdown full time. Unless you've been living under a rock, you're probably aware of the fact that inside of Alberta, we recently had a bunch of municipal elections. And with those municipal elections, we also had a couple of referendum questions that were put forward by the provincial government. One of those questions is definitely in contention for potentially the dumbest referendum question of all time. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about the equalization question. Ignoring the fact that equalization is an incredibly poorly understood federal program, and we went over that with in a previous episode with Trevor Toome to try to make sense of it. But secondary to that, what the question asked is whether or not equalization should be entirely removed from the Constitution. And it's really important to understand that in order to make changes to the Constitution, Constitution like that, you need to have at least seven provinces on board, and those seven provinces have to represent 50% of the population of Canada. It's an incredibly high bar to meet, and it's certainly not a bar that's going to be met by the province of Alberta having one little referendum all by themselves. 
Now, there were a lot of people that expected the equalization referendum to pretty much be a slam dunk. It's something that the UCP campaigned very heavily on in the 2019 election. It's something that a lot of the UCP MLAs and ministers have been talking about in the run-up to the referendum. And the reality is, equalization is a very poorly understood program by a lot of Albertans. There's still a lot of people who believe that Alberta sends equalization payments out to the rest of Canada, and that's just patently not true. But it's not looking like Jason Kenney is going to get the slam dunk that he was looking for. Early results out of Calgary indicate that only 58% of people voted yes to have equalization removed from the Constitution, which again isn't possible because of the numbers that I mentioned earlier. Some of the rural municipalities have numbers that are slightly higher, but the expectation is that when the numbers are finally officially released on October 26th, we're going to see Edmonton bring the overall average down. So no matter what, it's certainly not looking like the slam dunk that Jason Kenney was looking for. And that says a lot about the quality of the question. It says a lot about how much people actually care about that particular issue. And it, a lot of people are saying that it says a lot about how much confidence people have in Jason Kenney and his government. Now, obviously, this is a highly contentious issue, largely because of how poorly equalization is understood. And it's very clearly a wedge issue that Jason Kenney and the UCP believe that they can use to make people angry against, in particular, Ottawa and the rest of Canada. And there's been a lot of hyperbolic rhetoric that's been surrounding it. Perhaps none better example than a tweet that previous MLA and current editor-in-chief, I think, of the Western Standard, Derek Fildebrandt, put out on the day of the referendum, where he posted a picture of his ballot, and with that picture, he also posted some text to go along with it. For anyone who doesn't know, posting a picture of a ballot, on election day especially, is super, super illegal. But that's just the beginning of the story. There were a lot of people who were concerned about the fact that an ex-MLA and a current editor of a newspaper apparently had such little regard for the laws around elections, they started to raise the alarm. And the first place that a lot of people reached out to was Elections Alberta. And this is where the rabbit hole starts to get really really tangled because initially Elections Alberta put up a bunch of tweets that said well actually we don't know who's supposed to deal with this and then directed people to a bunch of different places including uh, Elections Calgary as well as 311 and then eventually the Calgary Police of all places. But then Elections Alberta's Twitter account decided to get into a bit of an argument with a couple of legal scholars from the Twitterverse and the snark got very very strong. It almost seemed as if for a good chunk of the time that it was actually one of the Premier's issues managers who was potentially running the Elections Alberta Twitter page on Election Day because it got pretty heated to the point where halfway through the day Elections Alberta actually took back control of their Twitter account from whoever was running their social media for them and issued a full-out apology and started to, lead, to delete a bunch of the tweets. Now, Elections Alberta has said that they're going to be doing a full investigation because that's not the tone of impartiality that they're normally supposed to have. But it's symptomatic of the kind of communications that we've seen from the government, and especially communications people within the government, where rather than try to educate people in a responsible, respectful way, they immediately go on the tack and they go with the absolute most amount of snark possible. It's really important to highlight that when we're talking about government institutions that are operating during an election, they're supposed to hold themselves to a much higher standard than really anybody else. Even though it's still only 2021, we're already seeing provincial parties starting to gear up for the next provincial election. The NDP have announced a bunch of candidates already, especially in the Calgary area. But what's interesting is the next election that we're likely to see isn't probably going to be the provincial election. There's a by-election that's due to happen in Fort Mac. For those of you that may not have caught it, during the federal election, one of the current UCP MLAs switched over to the federal team. And that means that there's a vacant seat in Fort Mac right now. Now, there's a lot of speculation going on as to who's going to run there. And one of the biggest names that keeps popping up is, in fact, Brian Jean. That's the area that Brian Jean lives in, and he's been making a lot of interesting movements in provincial politics. There was a lot of conversation about him potentially joining the Alberta Party and joining the Alberta Party leadership race, but that never came out to play, even though the Alberta Party is starting to have their own little cultural shift that might well be in preparation for the next...
municipal election, with their new leader openly saying that he doesn't want to be called a centrist anymore. So the Alberta party doesn't appear to be a centrist party anymore. Who knows what they are now? But back to Brian Jean, he didn't end up running in the Alberta party leadership race, so there's a lot of speculation that he might use this by-election as a doorway to get back into provincial politics. We haven't heard anything specific as to whether or not that's happening above and beyond rumors, but there's no question there is going to be a by-election in Fort Mac. It has to happen soon, and it's probably going to be one of the most contested races that we're going to see before the next provincial election. Back in August, when Alberta was just starting to get hit hard with the fourth wave of COVID, a lot of people were asking where Jason Kenney was. It was known that he was on vacation, and there's been a lot of speculation as to where he went for his vacation. We received some very reliable information that he actually spent the bulk of his vacation in Europe, but he hasn't confirmed where he was. He said that that's his personal business and nobody needs to know where the Premier of Alberta was during the beginning of the fourth wave of COVID that caused hundreds of deaths. But moving on from that, He's defended that vacation and the choice to go on vacation during the fourth wave of COVID by saying that he was in need of a break because he was getting really, really close to burning out. He's also said that while he was on vacation, he was in constant contact with his staff and officials, making sure that he knew exactly what was going on with the COVID situation. So uh, I took a two week break, summer break. Uh, haven't taken two week break. Uh, I've only had one other two week break since 2015. Um, uh, I was in daily contact uh, during my private time with uh, my staff, with senior officials, with fellow ministers. I had regular COVID briefings. We made, uh, uh, while I was on my private time, I participated in making decisions related to COVID. I took a couple of weeks of private time. I was in touch with my office every day and uh, was in touch with senior officials. I had uh, regular briefings um, and made decisions that we announced. So. Um, uh, and uh, maintain con contact with my office and officials uh, throughout. But CTV actually did a FOIP a little while ago, and in that FOIP they found that the vast majority of the vacation time was actually scheduled explicitly as personal time. And in fact, during the whole vacation, there were only two meetings on Jason Kenney's calendar that addressed the fact that he needed to be briefed on COVID. The rest of the time that the FOIP information received showed nothing. So it's a mystery. So there's a lot of, again, unsurprising inconsistencies coming from the Premier's office into what he was doing, and he still won't confirm where he actually was. One of the questions that Jason Kenney asked Albertans to ask themselves in the run-up to the 2019 election was simply, have their lives gotten better since the NDP formed government? And a lot of Albertans answered no to that question, and they voted in the UCP. Unfortunately for the UCP, what's happening now is people are starting to ask the same question about the UCP government. And at the top of the list in the last couple of weeks has to be private snow removal companies. One of the big things that's happened over the last little while is snow removal companies have started to go ahead and get their insurance for the snow removal season. But they've seen a huge increase in what they're being charged to the point where one company that Global News did a story on talked about how normally their premiums are about $6,800. It went up by adding a zero to the end of that number and then a little bit more still. Now the insurance companies are saying that it has to do with the fact that there's been a lot more um, commercial claims, but they're also attributing a lot of it to significant adverse weather events. So we're talking about events like what happened in Northeast Calgary, where not only a lot of homes were damaged, but a lot of businesses were damaged as well. And that jacks up the price for everyone. Unfortunately, there's no caps on insurance claims because the UCP actually don't like caps on insurance claims. They removed them from automobile rates when they first came into government. And they haven't made any sort of comment about things that they're going to do to make sure that these private companies can still operate. It's important to realize that a lot of the snow removal that we see done in malls and strip malls and private businesses aren't done by cities and municipalities. They're done by these private companies. And if these private companies can't do that, not only does it affect their bottom line, but it affects the bottom line of thousands of small businesses across the province. One of the other really interesting elements that could potentially come into play with the next provincial election has to do with Medicine Hat MLA Drew Barnes. Now Drew Barnes was kicked out of the UCP after trying to lead a little bit of a coup d'etat um, 
depending on how you want to spell that, you can spell it a bunch of different ways here in this province. But after trying to leave a little bit of a coup d'etat that failed, he was kicked out of the UCP and he's now sitting in the legislature as an independent MLA. He's now starting to pitch the idea that Alberta needs yet another political party, but this one needs to be focused only on rural Alberta to make sure that rural Alberta Conservatives are represented in a way that the UCP haven't been. Now this idea of Drew's is only in the preliminary stages and he hasn't put any major plans in effect yet, but it's fascinating to watch Drew Barnes and his ongoing grasp for relevancy as he continues to fall farther and farther down the political ladder. One of the biggest scandals that came out of the municipal election in Calgary has to do with incumbent and now re-elected MLA Sean Chu. Just a couple of days before the election took place, news broke that Sean Chu had actually been in quite a bit of trouble during his career as a police officer because he had a sexual encounter with a 16-year-old girl that he claimed he had picked up from a nightclub. Now, as the election went on, more details emerged, and it turns out that what Sean Chu described was not at all what was actually reported or investigated. It turns out that Sean Chu actually knew this young girl when she was only 14, and when she was 16 years old, he was called by another officer to pick her up and take her home. He did take her home, but not to hers. He took her to his, where there was some sort of sexual encounter, and even more alarming, it apparently involved a firearm. Now, the young girl tried to make multiple complaints to CPS over the years, and there was a, let's go with cursory investigation that was completed, and Sharon Chu was found guilty of discreditable conduct, and that was largely considered to be the end of it. But this young woman has been working to try to bring this story to light for quite some time. Just a couple of days before the final vote of the election, it broke and there's been a lot of really alarming revelations that have come out of this including some of the people that supported Sean Chu and this covers all levels of government because not only did former city councillor Jeremy Farkas donate to Sean Chu but in the provincial level Tyler Shandro donated to Sean Chu as well and it goes all the way up to federal because Michelle Rempel actually campaigned with Sean Chu. Now, in fairness to Michelle Rempel, she's since disavowed all of her support for Sean Chu, and she's done everything that she can to distance herself from him. But as of yet, we have not heard anything from Jeremy Farkas, and we haven't heard anything from Tyler Shandro either. So this is a story that's not going to be going away anytime soon, particularly given that multiple new members of the city council have said that they're going to do everything they can to get him out of office. Hello, my name's Ali and this is Nate, and Nate just lost. Tell us about that, Nate. You just lost. What did you lose publicly? Uh, publicly, I lost uh, an election, <laughs> uh, and I, I like to think that I lost it very well. You could do that? Lose things well? Oh, yeah. I guess I, you would I, know. I didn't just come in second. I think I came in fifth. Oh, wow. So if you're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna lose, lose well. Yeah, you're not even like on the podium for that. No medal, no nothing. No. no. I don't even think you get a ribbon. I, I think that, that they don't acknowledge you at all. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience with the media since the election was over. They And probably uh, during as well. Uh, yeah, by and large. Yeah, just yeah, ignored, was, lonely, yeah. afraid, cold. Rub it in. Losing. That's good. Feels good. Yeah, you asked me to be here. I will remind you of that now. <laughs> so you lost. Tell I me, did. Tell me more about that. Uh, well, it was the municipal election in Calgary, and I Which, was... Uh, just to clarify, this is now the second uh, level of government that you have lost. That's correct. I, I have now successfully lost at two levels of government. Yes. Yeah. Continue. Um, it was the, the municipal election for Ward 3 in Calgary, for uh -huh. the community that I live in. Um, they, I, yeah, you live there, and they didn't even want you. Apparently, well, some of them did. Like 16, but not enough. 1,600 apparently thought good things, and I think that's worth something. Um, but uh, yeah, I was I was asked to run by a, a bunch of community leaders, and then I s said yes. Uh, and you regret that deeply now after this I humiliating I, public I loss. I don't regret it at all. Um, I think there were some important conversations that I was able to be a part of, and I think that uh, it has given me a lot of insight as as to what a lot of the problems that we're facing in our democracy right now are. Like losing, uh, but also what what else do you think that you you learned from this? Well. 
Um, I think the biggest thing that I took away from it is that we, I think as a society, really have to rethink how we're, we're dealing with our democracy and how we're taking care of our democracy. And are you sure you're just not saying that because you lost, so there must no, be something wrong with no, the democracy? No, 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 no. Uh, the, but there are some, I'm not the only person who's raised these concerns. Are also losers? No, uh, some of them are, are bystanders, uh, I think, and, and political scientists and, and experts in this stuff. So I, I, I give their opinions some some weight, certainly more weight than a, a, a snappy, a angry loser. young lady. I was um, invited here. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's 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 some real real problems that I think that we have to collectively look at addressing because uh, one of the things that I think that we've forgotten is that democracy is a very fragile thing. It requires upkeep. It requires care. Uh, and I think that we've gotten a little bit too complacent about it and we've allowed some powerful forces to infiltrate it. And why do you think that? Uh, well, this was the first election that we've really seen the advent of what are called PACs or political action committees or TPAs or third party advertisers. These are organizations that have the ability to literally raise unlimited amounts of money outside of a six month period before an election. And they have the ability to spend incredible amounts of money separate from a candidate. So if a PAC is created specifically to support, say, a slate of candidates, then that PAC can spend as literally as much money as they want. We have PACs that we're spending tens of thousand of dollars uh, a week on Facebook advertisements to push specific candidates. And while most candidates don't have the ability to raise that kind of money, these PACs absolutely do and did. And they, they had a huge impact on the outcome of this election. So whoever they chose to support and to promote is who were, the winners were? By and large. Uh, there was a, a pack that ran a slate of, a pretty much a full slate of candidates, and of that slate I believe nine uh, were able to, to get in. Um, some of those candidates certainly got more support through social media advertising and print advertising than others did. Why that played out, that's up to the pack to say really. Hmm. Um, but certainly the, the candidates that the pack poured the most resources into appear to have been the ones that won. I mean, obviously there's a lot more forces at, at play than just the packs, but there's no question that the packs had a major influence on that. And I think it's really dangerous because there's a lot of people who don't realize a, what a PAC is, uh, or what a TPA is, B, how loose the rules and restrictions are, and the other piece of it is that's, that's alarming to me is that there aren't a whole lot of people who are raising the alarm about the PACs. We certainly saw candidates who would throw out lines like, well, yeah, I was supported by a PAC, but they're, they're separate from me. And if they're not, to me, if they're not condemning the, the role that PACs played in this election, then they're endorsing that role and, and they're directly benefiting from it. Right, because it's convenient for them because they obviously won. Yeah. Unlike you. Yes. So going back to your devastating loss here, Nate, uh, what do you think, uh, like, what did you learn after this, this lose? Like, what are you, what are you going forward with now? Um, I, I honestly don't know if our democracy is at a point where the rules that people play by are so, um, I'll go ahead and use the word corrupt by and large. I mean, we have, there's no shortage of examples of candidates who flagrantly violated election law. We took a, a picture on the way up here where the winning candidate from Ward 3 as well as the winning mayoral candidate have signs up on a prohibited roadway. They know full well that it's a prohibited roadway, but they're willing to do what it takes to win. Why is um, it prohibited? Uh, safety. Oh. So there's certain oh, roads. Oh, so who cares about your safety? Yeah, as long as we win. Uh, there's, there's certain roads, playground zones, intersections, there's certain places that you're just not allowed to put signs up. And all of the candidates are aware of this, but a lot of them uh, chose to completely disregard it. And I think that speaks to the culture that we've built around winning at all costs. And I'm proud of the fact that I didn't break any rules. Uh, and I, what I, one of the big things that I learned is that unless people get more engaged in democracy and start calling out the candidates themselves, then this behavior is going to continue, and I don't, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Um, the, one of the fascinating things for me was when I tried to call these things out, and uh, like honestly, at one of the debates, I received messages from people in the, the ward beforehand saying, hey, could you please ask them about this, because it's out of control. And I did, and I was immediately, the response from people was immediately, ah, oh, you're, you're just being bitter, you've got petty personal grievances, or you're just being a sourpuss. And the, the bottom line for, I, I don't know old people, um, but the, the bottom line for me is that 
we have to have people that are willing to, to call out this behavior. And it's abundantly clear that no one's gonna take me calling it out seriously as a candidate. So I'm gonna fully embrace my role with a breakdown. So is that you announcing that you will not be running uh, again at uh, any levels of government? I do not intend to be running for any levels of government anytime soon. Because uh, I don't think you've run federally yet. I, and you could fail on a whole new level I, nationwide. Nate Pike. <laughs> I, I could, but you know, I've had so much success at losing elections so okay, far yeah. that I really want to give somebody else the opportunity to to do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take that away from someone because it has been such a, a deeply rewarding experience for me. But I mean, you could go for it, like you know, because you're at only at two out of three right now. Why not go for three well, out of three? Well, there's there's Senate as well. Oh yeah, and oh, that would yeah. be even Why more there? even more meaningless to lose at. So uh, there's there's other options. But again, I think that the the I don't want to be greedy. I mean, I just I, want to lose again. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll lose at many, many more things. Like this conversation. Clearly. Yeah. I'm the winner here. Uh, yeah. You, so you're not running again. You're going you're gonna to hang out, slumming it here on the internet, saying your things with no one to tell you otherwise. That's the plan. I, Good I, plan. I think that if, if this conversation has, has demonstrated anything, there, there are people who are happy to tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm going to challenge you on that last point. Oh. Wow. Another white man with opinion on the internet here. <laughs> Telling a woman what to do. <laughs> Little on. <laughs> We're going to keep that in. We're going to keep that in. I feel like the breakdown is the, a very clear and uh, positive example of, well, when a man has an opinion that he loves very much, you get the breakdown. Um, I, I, you know, I would like to point out that I'm not the only one who's, who's expressed opinions on the breakdown. Uh, you have done a, 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 an absolutely mediocre job <laughs> of of expressing many opinions here. And I'm grateful for that because it makes me feel better about me. He uses me to make himself look better. <laughs> <laughs> he writes what I say. Every word. That's, that's not true. Mm. I didn't write any of how this started at all. <laughs> no, this got way meaner than you intended. It really did. I didn't know that you, you disliked me this much. It's all coming out now. <laughs> Do, do you have any other questions? That I don't know. Do like I? What did you script for me? <laughs> I, I didn't, though. <laughs> so is that it? That is that the interview? Well, uh, unless uh, uh, is there something else that you would like to say? I'm scared to, but I will. Okay. Um, I think the 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 biggest thing, in in all sincerity, that I'd like to say to people is mm. I that. Whether or not you're involved in democracy in a direct way, whether or not you're involved in it in a satirical way, whether or not you're involved in it in a just mean, mean, mean-hearted way, um, you have to be involved. And the, the big ask that I would have to everyone coming out of this is the only thing that's going to hold the behavior of elected officials to account is, is you. Uh, if you don't do that, then they're going to try to get away with more and more and more and more and more. And I think we certainly saw that in this election. I think we're certainly seeing it with our current provincial government. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're certainly seeing it with our municipal government. And we've certainly seen great examples of it with the federal government. I mean, the, the newly elected MP to my area is literally under investigation right now for stealing other candidates' campaign literature. Ooh. Yeah, so... Oh, the doorbell footage. Yeah, I saw that. Footage. That was yours. Yeah. Oh! So... I mean, that's not good. That's not good that that person won. No, it's it's not but it underscores the point that the only people that, that politicians will listen to are donors and voters and we don't have a whole lot of control because of the way the rules are right now especially around the PACs about who the donors are uh, so it's even more important that every single voter when you see a politician behaving badly call them out long call them out loud and that's what we're doing here I think that's I think. part of what we're doing here yeah this is making fun of Nate <laughs> well I I don't know, I, I learn a lot here and because uh, a lot of the time I think uh, politics can be kind of boring because it's not nearly as flashy as the TikToks that I usually watch. So uh, if you could get on that, making just, you know, a little nice little snippet. I don't think anybody the wants camp. to see the, the to your, your point from earlier, I don't think anyone wants to see the 45-year-old white guy on TikTok. 
I could be wrong. Perhaps there's a market I'm missing here, but um, I just have to do it while dancing. I I cannot dance. That's even better. Okay, maybe we'll try one later then. <laughs> Very good. So yeah, pay attention, because things are happening when you don't. And Nate lost. Yes, I did. That was the theme of this conversation. It certainly was. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And that's it for another episode of The Breakdown. On a quick little personal note, I just want to say that I'm really excited to be able to put all of my energies back into the show. And we've got some really great things that we've got lined up. We're going to be playing a little bit with the format, so we're going to continue going with the, the podcast and the episodes. But we're also going to be looking at doing weekly updates to round up all of the things that are going to be going on, especially with the legislature coming back into session right away here. We're going to continue to do our same long-form episodes where we're speaking to subjects subject matter experts about all of the issues that are going on and affecting Albertans and we've got a lot more planned so please stay tuned and if you're not already one of our Patreon supporters be in order for us to do all of the things that we've got planned we're gonna need some support so if you have a few extra bucks a month that you can spare if you visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash the breakdown AB and you can pledge a monthly small amount that'll make all of the difference and it'll help us be able to keep upping our game I want to thank everybody for listening to the show so far and taking this crazy ride with us and I just want to say how excited I am for what we're going to be doing next. Now with that referendum the expectation from a lot of people was because of how blah, 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 let's do that again <sighs> you have to have two-thirds of the House of Commons vote that's gonna be a problem so we're talking about big uh, things happening, really big things. They were big and they were things and they happened. Uh, you were very strongly against doing this for Alberta and uh, we have one now, yet we quickly noticed that we can, oh my God. Like, I, like I look like I'm wearing a tent. <laughs> he also said when he was defending his vacation choices, there's bells and that's what happened with the bells. We'll do that again. One of the other, th oh, brr, sorry, I got distracted by the loud. I feel like between the four different takes of that, there's something if you kind of, if you'd have him like nodding there and being like. Was very, very different. She actually filed multiple, multiple complaints. Holy shit. <laughs> that's not what I wanted at all. That's a lot of wind. Or I feel like it's more Titanic. If I just go the right way, just. Do -do -do, do -do -do -do. Oh, okay. Um, From subject matter. Let's do that again. To change the constitution in Calgary, you, or in Canada, not Calgary, let's do that again, was whether or not their lives had gotten better and cheaper during the four years of the NDP giving it. Giving it. Uh, okay, train of thought. Back on it. Uh, oh, I moved out. Oh, you moved or I moved? Okay, we're good? Okay. Oh, it's good I screwed up. Somebody's having a lot of fun over there. They got like a crane 